morning, Dr. Laurie Morrison. Uh, my name is Martin Johnson. I'm a paramedic with uh, Toronto EMS, and I'm here to ask you a few questions about uh, the Rock uh, Alps. Is it Rock Alps? It's just, Rock Alps. It's and, Rock Alps. And see, see how confused we are. It's perfect, and I'm happy to be here. So we have some set questions. So that... I have some questions that paramedics have delivered to us. Okay. Um, so we've been trained three times now in, in this Alps study, and we haven't come... We haven't seen it on the road yet, right? Uh, why is an Alps launched, and why didn't you? Why did you wait until the regulatory documents were completed before training us? Excellent. Okay, so Rock Alps hasn't launched in Canada. It's launched in the United States, and the reason it didn't launch in Canada was we weren't aware when we were started organizing and training for Rock Alps. We didn't realize that Health Canada has taken a different tact with regulated trials. And it's actually since the Nancy Oliveri trial. And what Health Canada is doing is uh, treating all regulated trials with extreme detail. And previously, we'd done all these rock trials where just the Institute signed off as the sponsor for Health Canada without any concerns. Now, if the Institute is the sponsor of a trial, Health Canada has the right to come in and investigate thoroughly the Institute, and all the paperwork has to be in good working order, similar to an industrial trial. We were never held to that level of scrutiny before for peer-reviewed trials that are funded by the Canadian government and the U.S. government, but now it's applied to everyone. And Health Canada is a force to be reckoned with because they can shut you down as an institute to do research mm -hmm. if they find even mild or modest uh, um, infringements on what the regulation demands. So with that in mind, it's taken us 19 months to process Health Canada's regulatory documentation in a way we've never had done before. And we just completed that with Health Canada and St. Mike's has taken on to be the sponsor of the trial for Canada. So it took us a long time and it was not anticipated. Okay, so for future trials, because I'm sure there'll be other research mm -hmm. coming up, when do you expect all these issues with the trials to be finally resolved and when do you expect the trial to go live? As part of the solution this time, what we did was we met uh, CIHR, which is the Canadian Government Funding Agency for Peer Reviewed Research, so their director and the three directorates of Health Canada met with a conference call with the U.S. government and all the investigators and they confirmed over the conference call and following in a writing that Canadian and U.S. consortiums like, like ROC, which are led by investigators and funded by uh, Canadian and U.S. government money, now have a template of how to do this well. So we've got something in place. We broke ice with Rock Alps, and an area we've never been in before. But now we've got a recipe to go forward. And m most importantly, we've got Health Canada to put it in writing that this is acceptable. Great. That's, I mean, we broke out ice with Rock <laughs> Alps, and we're doing the ice pack study very soon. That's very true. Great yeah. to, to link everything together. Um, do you expect all these issues to be sorted out? And when can the trial go live? So the only residual uh, right now is of all our 37 hospitals, one research ethics board has given us difficulty, and that's Humber. Um, but they have promised that they will uh, review it quickly and give us a response. So I anticipate that in the next 14 days. That's the only hospital regulatory body that's holding us back. The second issue is when you do a regulated trial with Health Canada, under these new regulations, um, the sponsoring hospital, which is St. Michael's Hospital, must have a subcontract agreement with both base hospitals. So since Lake Ridge Hospital is the base hospital for Durham EMS and uh, Sunnybrook uh, Pre-Hospital Centre is the base hospital for um, Peel, Halton, Toronto, Simcoe, and Muskoka, we need to have a subcontract agreement with both of those institutes. So this, again, is legal schmiegel and regulatory work, and those things take time. Um, but they know they're under the gun. The lawyers at all those institutes know they're under the gun because the Canadian regulatory body and CIHR, the people who fund the trial, are watching to see how fast these hospitals can respond now that they have a template. So I'm hopeful that they'll resolve these subcontract agreements in the next month. 
So my anticipated launch for ALPS is September 1st. Okay, so at the end of the summer, you anticipate to see the launch. And because the, I believe the last time I was trained anyway in ALPS was probably in the fall CME. I don't right. think we did it in the winter CME. No. Um, is there going to be a review package? Is there going to be material given out to the paramedics so that when September 1st hits and they see this ALPS kit show up in their vehicles, they know what to do with it. So uh, yes, the, we have a, we have videos for them. We'll hopefully have a, some kind of continuing education module that they can do for points um, towards their CME. And if the service or whatever service or their group of medics themselves, the providers tell us they want to be retrained, then we'll retrain them from September, December and delay the launch for January. At this point, it's most important. This is a drug trial that's regulated by Health Canada. Let's do it right. Mm -hmm. So if the provider and the operator say we want to wait and launch after retraining, I'm happy to do that. Okay. Uh, I know ALPS is comparing lidocaine, amiodarone, and just plain saline. Um, these are currently being used in the field, as we all know. Uh, why are we looking at these drugs again? Right. So Toronto and Seattle um, really have determined the science um, for the current guidelines, 2010, they're the only two services that did a randomized control trial comparing amiodarone to lidocaine. Um, Toronto compared amiodarone to Lido. Seattle compared amiodarone to placebo. Both trials showed that survival to arrive alive in the hospital was better with amiodarone. But both trials didn't have sufficient numbers, didn't have the power to show any difference for survival to discharge. So that's why the recommendation in the 2010 guidelines is suggested, but mm -hmm. there is enough evidence to say this is an absolute. Mm -hmm. So we want to finish the science off, run a proper randomized control trial, follow the patients all the way to discharge so we can so show definitively one is better than the other. And most importantly, since one did it against placebo and one did it at Lido, this particular trial compares all three, uh, plain saline, lidocaine, and amy amiodarone. You, you briefly talked about numbers. I know there's about 20 patients enrolled in the United States right now under Correct. the ALPS trial. How many patients are you looking to enroll in this study to make this study valid? Right. I believe, I don't know the number right off my heart, and I know it's not down my notes. I think it's approximately 4,000 patients. Don't hold me to that. Um, Seattle started first. The PI of the Seattle trial, the old trial, amiodarone versus placebo, was Peter Kudinchuk. So it's only appropriate that his medics start the trial first. Mm -hmm. And so they did in Seattle in May, and they've enrolled about 20 patients. Uh, Sorry, we anticipate yeah. that it'll take us about three years. Knowing how many patients are recruited in all the ROC services, we anticipate it's going to take three years to finish the trial. Um, so the, if you don't want to make the trial any longer, you have to make sure they're trained well and they enroll every, po every possible patient. So those are the keys to making the trial last only three years. Okay. And... Since lidocaine and amiodarone and saline are currently given in, in cardiac arrest patients in, in North America, why was it so hard to get the legislative bodies to agree uh, to approve this trial? So if that's an interesting question. So first of all, this is a waiver of consent trial. So the patient doesn't have the opportunity to consent, understand what they're consenting to. So waiver of consent trials are held to the highest possible standard because you have to protect the patient, right? Mm -hmm. That's the first. The second thing is, is that this trial is against plain saline, which as you know, about 60% of our patients right now in VF cardiac arrest get plain saline because they don't have access to any of the other, uh, other antiarrhythmics. And it's not clear in the services across North America and Canada, some are you still using lidocaine, some are using amiodarone. So in the 40% that do get antiarrhythmics, it's probably about 50-50 about who gets Lido and who gets Amio. So we've got three treatments in play right now, and what we want to do is randomize the patients to one of these three treatments. So the randomization component, the fact that it's waiver of consent, and the fact that one arm is plain saline, all those three things might be disconcerting to a research ethics board and to lay people on the research ethics board. So you have to be able to explain the science to them in a way that they feel comfortable, 
knowing that the standard of care, that all three arms are the standard of care, and they're going to be measured in a rigorous way to actually advance the science. So if we find out that amio is the best drug, that people no longer will receive lidocaine and no longer will receive plain saline, that this is the drug of choice. And if you can explain the science to the Research Ethics Board in a way that they can understand and they can see in the end it will be a benefit to patients and nobody's going to be compromised mm -hmm. because they're all getting the standard of care, um, then the Research Ethics Board feels comfortable. But first it's the science and second it's the safety of the patient and the fact that they're going to get good care. So thank you for explaining to the, the waiver of consent. I know that's a common question on the road as well is how do we get consent in the cardiac arrest patient from the family and right. things like that to participate or to enroll the patient in a study. So thank you for explaining that. Just a note on that, it's, it's a good point that you raised because in the ALPS trial, Rock ALPS is regulated not only by Health Canada but also by the FDA and the FDA demands that all the medics have access to a consent. So if somebody taps them on the shoulder and says, I see you're using a study kit, mm -hmm. they can, in, within the study kit, we're going to have a little um, quote, uh, not quote. Um, a letter. A, a, it's a little letter that gives them a speech. Mm -hmm. It actually gives them the consent speech, which is approved by the FDA, which explains to whoever it was, the the family member explains to them that this what this trial is doing, that it's it's a waiver of consent trial governed by um, Health Canada and the FDA. And so it's a prescribed speech that the medics can refer to. We haven't had, in all the trials we've done, haven't had a single case where anyone at the scene has ever asked a medic, mm -hmm. not that I'm aware of. Um, and so this is, and this is unique, we've never done this before, but the FDA said at least have it handy for them so that in case the one person in a million who does ask, the medic has something, a script that they can go to to ensure they say it right. I know medics seem, or they feel like they, they've got like this research fatigue almost because right. we keep on getting trained on research, we keep on talking about research. Yeah. and. Sometimes it takes longer for the research to hit the road as we see in the Alps. But are there any other allied health professionals like nurses, respiratory therapists that work in a hospital that get given similar protocols to participate or enroll patients in studies? Sure. So I would say every discipline, no discipline short of the ward clerks and the maintenance people are immune from doing some, from a, being, participating in research. So. For example, in some of my own trials on cooling mm -hmm. uh, post-arrest patients, and now I'm doing a trial on PCI post-arrest and another one on um, avoiding withdrawal of life-sustaining -sustain therapy too early mm -hmm. on post-arrest patients. So in all three of those trials, we had to give a protocol to nurses and respiratory techs as well as to ED and ICU physicians, and they have to comply with the protocol whenever they get one of your post-arrest patients. And when they don't comply, we report their, you know, their the fact that they're out of protocol. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's important. If you're in healthcare in, in 2000, uh, you're going to be involved in science. Mm -hmm. um, the emphasis now, because it's so expensive to do, uh, to give healthcare, to give high quality healthcare, we're going to, we're all held to the very high standard of evidence-based practice. And when you truly look at how much evidence there is in emergency medicine, we have a lot to, to prove. So if you're in emergency medicine or ICU in the next 20 years, you're always going to be involved in science. I heard a quote actually in the early 2000s that in the next 10 years of my clinical life, 90% of what I knew that I learned in medical school or residency, 90% would change between 2000 mm -hmm. and 2010, and it was right. You, you, it's so hard to stay up, but we're making huge advances in emergency medicine, so everything we do should be under scrutiny. So Along those lines, another common question is, uh, does the medic have to participate? Do they have the choice to say, no, I don't want to enroll these patients in studies, I don't do studies? Right, so it is voluntary. To participate in science in research should be voluntary. We've tried to make it so simple for every medic, so no additional paperwork to fill out, etc., so that uh, we're not imposing on the practicing medic, but we're actually making it easier. As you know, this amiodarone format that we're trialing 
comes in a, a syringe. Mm -hmm. So it makes it easier for the practicing medic to use the anterior rhythmic because they just literally have to open the kit and use the syringes in the order they're presented as opposed to the formulation of amiodarone, which is, curly, amiodarone. Yeah, which is course, so yeah. labor intensive mm -hmm. in the field under chaotic circumstances. So hopefully we've balanced the fact that they no longer can be voluntary in Rock Alps with, we, but we've made your life easier and we're not asking anything more of you. Okay. I think you've answered all of my questions. Thank you very much for uh, taking the time to do that this morning. You're welcome, Martin. Thank you.